the goals didn't go in. So I think, you know, clinical finishing is something that was missing a little bit. So they'll look to be more clinical. So obviously you look at, uh, at forwards and, and, uh, those, those people up front, when you, when you talk about, uh, uh, Justin Dillon, uh, and then having a presence like Amando Moreno, who scored 10 last year for United, New Mexico United, up the way, had a very, very good season. That that creative presence at kind of the top of it. But I think maybe the most depth is going to be in the back line, which is going to be absolutely critical. But it's an absolute treat to finally have this here in El Paso. Locomotive has played, obvious, as you pointed out, a couple of games uh, and exhibitions south of the border um, at uh, Benito Juarez but they've never been in El Paso. So I think it's going to be great for the fans. Um, I think it's it's just a little unfortunate that they're, you know, it's right in the middle of the week after you've played three and then you're on the road two days after that to play Las Vegas Lights. So yeah, it's a challenge and, and you want to keep uh, people fresh. But, but honestly, this is the game that needed to happen. I'm very happy they finally made it happen. And uh, I think that it's it's going to be great for the city of El Paso, as well as for Ciudad Juarez and the borderland community at large, because these are the teams, man. These are these are the folks who are carrying the mantle uh, for both sides of uh, of our shared border. Welcome to a new edition of the Go Club Podcast. I'm your host Elena Gal, and today we're going to be talking about local soccer. We're going to be talking about the El Paso locomotive who start their campaign uh, Saturday, March 9th, I guess, the Hartford Athletic at Southwest University Park. And to talk more about the locomotive, what better guests than the voice of the locomotive, uh, Duke Keith joining us once again here at the Gold Club. Duke, thank you so much for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Edwin. Just trying to stay, uh, as, as, as we record this, it's dusty and breezy, but it's March in El Paso. So I'm just, I'm just trying to stay without a mouthful of dirt right now. It's, it's good. I'm indoors. All right. It's fine. All right. Good to good to, be, to hear that. Uh, so let's just get started. Uh, new season is wrapped on us. It's uh, the sixth year now for the for locomotive uh, in the USL Championship. How do you feel about these already being uh, year six for for uh, local soccer? It is. It's amazing to think, uh, especially for all of the all of the bad old days when there weren't when, when there wasn't anything going on at all after the demise of the El Paso Patriots. I think their final season was 2012 or so um you know it just kind of went away and uh actually yeah 2011 2012 might have been even earlier but it was it was uh a long few years without it and it's just it's wonderful to have it back and especially with mountain star sports group to do such a fine job and are i know are very well regarded in the usl headquarters just you know uh, i think that they've they've been kind of a rock especially uh, an anchor, so to speak, especially during the uh, the year of COVID in 2020, uh, it was very good to have that that steady, steady, uh, steady at the at the wheel, kind of a presence uh, in Mountain Star Sports Group in terms of their ownership. So I know they appreciated it, and I know that uh, they are they're a well thought of organization, and they strive to do things the right way. Already, uh, so uh, last year we had uh, the first year under uh, Brian Clairhot uh, as a head coach. Uh, the team managed to get to to play us, but uh, gave like that the first round. Uh, so what uh, what did you see from from his team? Uh, what gets you excited to to see how things go in year two? Obviously, very different from Mark Lowry. Lowry liked to control things. Uh, didn't mind you know one nil score lines. Didn't mind a nil nil tie a tie or a draw on the road. Uh, this is slightly uh, a little more heavy metal football, so to speak, and and very much kind of in that modern style. I think that a lot of teams have where, uh, you know, one of your more creative players could be your right back, you know? Uh, and, and I think it is, it, it, they, they might have the personnel this year to really pull that off. And I think one of the key things that, that he's looked for this season, Brian clear out is depth and, uh, whether it's Loney's from Ciudad Juarez and Juarez Bravo, uh, which they are, you know, actively, uh, using that association through Mountain Star Sports Group to bring those players in, younger players who might need a little seasoning uh, and won't otherwise see the field for Bravos, uh, I think that that's really helping. Uh, Loney's, and, and I'm thinking uh, specifically of uh, Brendan Craig from Philadelphia Union. Uh, they're on the right back, right wing. Uh, I think he's going to be a real key piece to the puzzle 
should he be able to uh, step in? And, and of course, you know, health is always a factor, but that's one of the reasons I think he's looked for depth. Uh, I think it is, it's a gung-ho style in, uh, in what is largely uh, a gung-ho kind of a league, a very physical, very athletic, and, uh, and clear out has tried to address that with this team this year. All right. Uh, let's, let's go to some of the names that, uh, all the new arrivals, obviously, uh, Tony Alfaro, who has a pass in the Seattle Sanders and in Chivas, uh, is now on the team. He's a 30 year old center back. Uh, I have uh, also the list, uh, uh, Amanda Moreno, a winger that uh, comes from uh, New Mexico United, which is going to be interesting. Um, see how, how well the defense, uh, uh, like him, I uh, think to, to his liking. Uh, Ramon Pasquel, who is a, uh, was a goalie for Bravos last year, he had a couple good uh, performances, which he was required uh, in the league when Talavera went down with injury. So there's like, a few interesting, uh, and then Francisco de Valle is another uh, right back uh, that coming from Bravos. So among the, the names that, the new names, the new faces, which ones are you most uh, excited to see in year uh, this year? Well, I think, uh, obviously, when you talk about, uh, I think when you talk about this team, you you want to talk about the way they move forward uh, because that's that's a real key. And I think one of the things that was missing last year, um, you know, they had the, the seven-game win streak, which was a, which was a, a, a team record, 10-game unbeaten streak, a team record. But then there was that, that malaise, where all of a sudden the team that was at one point number one in the league, ranked number one uh, by many people, just tanked. And the goals didn't go in. So I think, you know, clinical finishing is something that was missing a little bit. So they'll look to be more clinical. So obviously you look at uh, at forwards and, and uh, those those people up front when you, when you talk about uh, uh, Justin Dillon, uh, and then having a presence like Amando Moreno, who scored 10 last year for United, New Mexico United, up the way, had a very, very good season. That that creative presence at kind of the top of it. But I think maybe the most depth is going to be in the back line, which is going to be absolutely critical. And you then you've got a couple of uh, keepers. You you, meant, you mentioned Ramon Pascual, uh, Pascual uh, in from Ciudad Juarez. But uh, I think uh, the the guy who's going to get the the nod and, and the starter is uh, um, Jamali Waite, the Jamaican international. Uh, but you know you need an adequate keeper because he's going to be called up for the national team probably to play for the Reggae Boys more than once. And uh, and uh, Ramon Pascual uh, Pascual uh, should certainly be a presence there. So I think in the back line and goalkeeper, uh, you talk about depth. You talked about some of the options at right back. And, and you know, kind of those the the left back, right back, uh, they're going to be very deep there. And let's not forget about Miles Lyons, who has been now part of this team. This is his third season for Locomotive FC. Uh, the kid's only 21 years old. Wait a minute, I think he may have actually just be 20. I may have to look that up. But in his early 20s, and and he's already been a part of a professional organization uh, through his teenagers, and now. Uh, as he enters his uh, 20th uh, or his second decade uh, of life on earth, he's he's really, you know, made a name for himself with Locomotive FC, and he's going to be in the mix, and he's going to have to step up because whereas he was, you know, needed quite a bit uh, last year, um, there are a lot of names out there that are going to apply, uh, that are going to be probably above him on the roster uh, going into the season and uh, have to work to find a space with this team. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's also like keep in mind like the, the guys are coming back. You mentioned uh Miles Lance, uh, uh you also have Yuma, you also have uh Taylor Hans and some of the other uh, defenders, Eric Caudillo, most of all the defensive uh, minded uh, players. So it really seems that what one of the primary focuses of season is to improve uh the defensive unit for for, for the team. Yeah, and I think uh, when you look at the returnees, there are guys like Nick Hines. Uh, but but it's it's a lot in in the middle along the wings. And they had Borelli. Let's not forget him. I mean, this is his fifth season with Locomotive. Here's the guy when he first got here, he played only eight games for Mark Lowry his first season. Lowry needed to see what he was about, and then the next year it was like over thirty games. And the year after that, he just finds a way to work himself in, and then and then he doesn't leave. 
Uh, so I, I would expect him to be in the mix, even though, you know, he's in his 30s now. Uh, he's going to be really something to look at. But you look at the returnees, Eric Calvillo in the middle, I think it's going to have some help. Um, Petar Petrovic. Uh, my understanding is that Petar, at least to start the season, I know he's nursing. Uh, it's the same injury that's kind of beset him for the last year. And uh, and just it's on and off. So uh, I think, though, that if Brian Clairhout can put Petar Petrovic on the pitch, then uh, then he absolutely will because – you will not find a more dynamic player, especially in the wing, especially in that left wing, uh, than, than Petar Petrovic. Whether it is service into the box, whether it is clinical finishing, uh, speed up the wing, that's a guy who is you absolutely want him out there. And he's on the roster. He's ready to go. Um, I just think you you look up and down this roster, and there are, there is talent all over the pitch. A guy like Justin Dillon who won a you know, USL championship with San Antonio two years ago. Absolute mainstay for San Antonio. And is now in El Paso, somebody that Brian Clare had his eye on for many, many years, he says. And uh, I think one of the other things you notice when you look up and down this roster is a little more American talent. Brian Clare making no secret of the fact that he appreciates the American player uh, and, and wants that element on his team more. And I think that the, this year's roster certainly reflects that. Yeah, and I was just counting... Uh... So all the incoming players, there's nine between goalkeepers, defenders, and defensive midfielders. Uh, nine new players, so that's definitely a, a, a big focus. Uh, obviously, the we were talking about uh, what uh, Justin Dillon can bring to a team coming from uh, San Antonio FC. Uh, he should be the the, the front man, the, the the main focal point of the attack. Now that uh, uh, Lucius Olingak left, coincidentally uh, to San Antonio FC. Uh, uh, so is, is that who you expect to be the, the, the starting line for, for the team? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, the, the guy's got a proven track record, and you don't bring a player like that in to, to you know, make him compete for us. Well, everybody's in competition for a spot, but you don't bring in a player like that and not, not have him out there to be your focal point, to be that hold-up number nine. I know as uh, they talk about his movement off the ball, they talk um, but, um, you know, when you talk about Ricardo Zacarias, he's still here. I think that that speaks volumes for Ricardo, who came over from Chattanooga Red Wolves, what, three or four seasons ago, and hasn't left. Here's the guy who's from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And uh, it seems to me, he has, I think up until last year when, when he was, you know, kind of hurt a little bit, had progressed every season he's been part of the squad. So I look forward to watching him kind of continue that progression. I think the other guy I'm thinking of is, uh, is Joaquin Rivas, uh, another El Salvador international along with Calvillo, along with Moreno, uh, who is, uh, had a great season for the Miami FC, uh, last year. And here's another guy who's been in the league for a while. He's in his thirties, but absolutely knows his way around and, and knows how to move. And, uh, I think that, you know, just, especially the kind of that, I think one of the things is this year, there's a lot more USL experience on this roster. Uh, and, you know, just being able to deal with this league um, might have been an issue for some of the players who came in not expecting it to be what it was. Uh, physical, long, the travel's challenging. I think for any player who's been in Europe and, you know, you take a two-hour train or bus ride somewhere and you're you're ready to go. Not in the United States. Not at any level of the professional game in this country. Um, the travel is long and, and it's challenging and obviously you're playing during the summer and that's very different and, uh, and also a challenge, uh, especially in some of the different climates. But, um, so I think that there are more American players, more USL players in this roster. Uh, and that I think from Brian Clarehouse's perspective is by design. Right. I uh, was just looking, uh, some of the stats for Justin Dillon in USL, uh, 38 goals in 138, uh, appearances and 19 assists. So. A uh, good record, but the, the one thing that is a little concern is last year, I think he had a down year with the San Antonio FC. I think he only yeah. scored like three goals uh, the year. So hopefully we get a, have to see a good bounce back from, from Dallin, uh, for Dylan uh, up front. Uh, I think that's so, what they're looking for. Maybe just trying to revitalize things and just, you know, restart it in a different place. Sometimes uh, all you need is a, a change of venue. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, and obviously, uh, first game is uh, this weekend against Hartford. I mean, what do you expect uh, to to see that's going to remain the same from Claire Hunt? And what do you expect to be new for, for this season? I think that I think that, that just talking with some of the people, that could legitimately be a 4-3 game. <laughs> These are teams, both of them, uh, are going to counter. Uh, and uh, I think that the hope for, for locomotive is that they will have space to counter. Uh, you know Hartford is going to be direct. Uh, Brendan Burke is, uh, Brendan Burke is, is uh, an outstanding coach, has done very well, did very well, very well with Colorado Springs, switchbacks, uh, and, of course, went to Houston Dynamo. Uh, he is now back. And uh, and with Hartford Athletic, he's a New England kid, but he brought a lot of that switchbacks firepower with him. Guys like Romario Williams, um, uh, Michi Galina, and Galina is, is a part of this roster as well. I mean, some just outstanding young talent and guys who can flat out fly. So that's going to be the challenge for Locomotive is, is to mind your back line. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I know that, that Claire Hout wants to, as, as John Morrissey, uh, uh, USL Tactics on Twitter put it, uh, plays a, a wonky 4-4-2. That's how they started. I think that, uh, you know, the five-man back line was kind of how things ended up just to stop the bleeding because Locomotive at one point was defensively terrible. So they just they had to figure something out. Versus Hartford, you might see a little of that. I'm thinking of just more on the back to kind of handle the pressure that Hartford is definitely going to apply. Uh, might be what we see, but locomotive can get up and down the field. And I'm very much looking forward to, uh, from what I understand, the good passing from Brendan Craig out of the back, something that uh, locomotive fans might remember from, from uh, the likes of, but uh, yeah, Brendan Craig is, is line splitting balls out of the back that, that will be fun to watch. Meshach Jerome, excuse me. Okay. Gotta yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess to an extent what Eric Alvillo's, Tends to do when he gets to play the like a video. I'm uh, was a left. Oh, Borelli. Left. Borelli, Borelli. Oh, yeah, Borelli. Yeah, yes. So that type, that type of player, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, Calvillo is. I think. Uh, I think that the design was to try and push him a little further up in the midfield, and uh, to kind of him. He and Liam Rose just had an understanding. I think that that's one more player that that everybody sleeps on a bit is Liam Rose. Uh, the, the the young man from Australia uh, has done a fine job since coming over three seasons ago as part of John Hutchinson's squad. Uh, Hutch is former roommate in in the Aussie leagues and uh, or, uh, and down under, but but here's a guy who's really just held down the number six role, which is you know kind of taking the reins from Richie Ryan back in the day and and just being that guy, the defensive midfielder. And his link-up play with Eric Alvillo was really key in, in the success that Locomotive had, especially early in the season. I think that they want to, uh, you know, make that happen again. Uh, but Liam Rose, I think, is going to be critical to link up with Calvillo and Moreno in the middle and then uh, and then kind of uh, moving forward. So I think that uh, when, when you talk about somebody like Calvillo, um, I think as the offense kind of flows through, he might be a real key, although I think uh, service from the wings is going to be a big part of uh, the way Locomotive moves forward this year. All right. And uh, out of the department players, I mean, we, we have both uh, the Ukrainian guys, Dennis and Cole, leaving uh, Eric McHugh at the back. Uh, we mentioned, obviously, uh, Lucho Solignac, but also, like, he's a little unfortunate, like, the local kid, uh, Luis Chaparrera, is uh, with the team going to Greenville. Uh, so which is going to be, like, the toughest uh, but to fill for, for, for a local boy, which one might be the one that they had the hardest time to? Well, I think, you know, the, the jury's out on how many goals they're going to score. But, you, I mean, you're talking about Lucho Solignac, who's uh, the number one, he's the, the, the top goal scorer in locomotive history. Uh, he and Aron Gomez, who are also, he's also gone. Uh, that's losing your kind of one-two punch, at least over the seasons. I know uh, Aron did not have the season he, he wanted to have last year. Uh, nor did Lucho, for that matter. Uh, but they are still, um, I think, what, one and two in the record book uh, for Locomotive FC. So, you know, you're taking out a lot of goals. You're having to replace that. Now, by reputation, I think they have. When you're talking about Moreno, when you're talking about Rivas, when you talk about uh, when you talk about uh, the big man up front, <laughs> Justin Dillon, uh, on paper, they've done that. But, you know, 
on paper and uh, in real life, IRL, that's a different story. So I think that those are th those are the names that leap off the page, at least in terms of the departing players. Yeah, and also uh, I want to mention there's another winger, South African winger that they brought from the San Diego Loyal. Let me get the name because I had it here by for this is gonna go. Uh, oh yes, Tumi, Tumi Moshabani. Yes, Tumi Moshabani, uh, twenty-nine year old from South Africa. So it's another winger option. So uh, they're definitely trying to retool up uh, some of the players that can help create chances uh, for the number nine. And hopefully, we'll see how that pans out. Well, well, I know Moshabani was uh, a hot commodity. There were a lot of teams that wanted him, and he really lit things up for San Diego Loyal. Uh, he will be an absolutely critical part of the attack. You're absolutely right. So, yeah, I mean, on paper, this is a team that's going to be able to get up the field in a hurry and be what they hope is going to be a little more clinical uh, in, in pushing those uh, pushing in those goals. That's, that's important. For sure. Uh, and now, look, uh wanted to also talk to you about uh, in March, we're going to have uh, in a couple of weeks, I think the 20th, uh, we're going to have for the first time uh, El Paso Como to take on uh, FC Juarez on a friendly game. Uh, so it's going to be the first two times that the teams that are part of the Mountain Stars group will be on the field in an official friendly match. I mean, they, they have some scrimmages in the past. Uh, but uh, are you looking forward to that uh, game? Uh, and what do you hope to see out of that game? What do you think uh, fans from the borderline can learn, uh, can learn from, from that game. Yeah, and I think it's it's unfortunate, I think, that it's coming so early and right after Locomotive. Locomotive is starting, uh, they're going to start with three games in basically a week. That's hard. That's hard. The league games, Hartford Athletic to start on the 9th, then in the middle of the week on the 13th is Monterey Bay, uh, then on the 16th it's Louisville City. So you've got yeah, I mean, seven days, eight days, really, uh, three games. So that's a challenge right out of the gate. And then comes the Juarez exhibition, which is, I mean, it's an exhibition. I think you could take your foot off the gas. I would imagine we'll get to see lots of players. Uh, I imagine we'll get to see uh, lots of the bench uh, for both teams. But it's an absolute treat to finally have this here in El Paso. Locomotive has played, obvious, as you pointed out, a couple of games uh, and exhibitions south of the border um at uh benito juarez but they've never been in el paso so i think it's going to be great for the fans um i think it's it's just a little unfortunate that they're you know it's right in the middle of the week after you played three and then you're on the road two days after that to play las vegas lights so yeah it's a challenge and, and you want to keep uh, people fresh but but honestly this is the game that needed to happen i'm very happy they finally made it happen and uh, I think that it's it's going to be great for the city of El Paso, as well as for Ciudad Juarez in the borderland community at large, because these are the teams, man. These are these are the folks who are carrying the mantle uh, for both sides of uh, of our shared border, and uh, it's great. Um, I'm I'm very very happy that they're actually having it. Yeah, I agree. And uh, just for uh, fans listening, I mean, I can tell you for a fact that the uh, fans from the fan group El Cartel in, in, in from Bravos. Uh, they're excited for the game, so I've been talking to a few of them in recent days because I'm working on a separate project for the podcast about the, the story of Indian Juarez uh, 15 years ago. So I've been talking to a lot of them, and they are also talking about this game and that they wanted to to have a presence at Southwest University Field uh, for that game. So uh, that's something to to keep an eye out for as well. I will love hearing that. I mean, at eighth notch and in Cartel, that is, I mean, that's what it's all about, and this is a game that should happen. Honestly, on both sides of the border, uh, every year, um, it would be it would be lovely to to see that returned as well. But uh, uh, and in the open, I know that they've been closed. Uh, I think the first year, obviously, there was COVID going on. So yeah, it it it's just nice to have it in public and to be able to sell tickets and have fans from both teams come out. I, I look forward to hearing El Cartel, El Cartel. I know they will be heard in Southwest University Park. Alrighty, and uh, just uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you uh, about uh, is uh, regarding US Open Cup. Uh, obviously, uh, all twenty four teams from US Open Cup but will take part of it. The big controversy during this offseason is that MLS has been pushing hard to not take part of it. In the end, it's gonna be only eight MLS teams that will be uh, taking part of it. Uh, uh, but obviously, teams that are playing the Concacaf Champions Cup, like Inter Miami and some of the others are out. Uh, FC 
And so what's your, what are your thoughts on, on, on the decision of, of Nat sending most of his teams and then what that means for the rest of the field? I think it's a terrible decision that MLS has, has made and uh, and are they are rightfully being derided for it. Uh, in some of their own markets, especially a city like St. Louis, which has such a rich history with the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup, so many winners uh, from from the times when, you know, before professional soccer really took back over in the mid-1990s in this country, uh, from the times when it was about, you know, uh, the amateur teams, the great amateur sides. Um, this is a city with a rich tradition in the U.S. Open Cup, and they're very disappointed, the people in St. Louis, that, the, that their team is not a part of it. And uh, it's sad, frankly. It's sad that that MLS... I understand. Look, ML, American soccer is better for Major League Soccer. The game doesn't come to this point. I don't think maybe even the USL comes to this point without MLS without MLS's existence. And I know why they had that single entity structure in the mid 1990s. It wasn't to to be a monolithic, the the monolithic thing that it is now, or is, at least it's trying to be, when it comes to American soccer. It was to survive. They didn't want to be the NASL and then just fold up shop and have everybody, you know, the NASL's problem was that every team had individual ownership and then, you know, spent way more than they were making to bring in the big European talents in the hopes that people were going to come and show up. But they they never they never did it the right way. Not that MLS is the right way, but the whole point of the single entity structure was to survive and they almost didn't do that they almost didn't make it into the 2000s they did obviously david beckham came things started to change the roster rules have opened up a lot et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and now mls is what it is uh, and they're trying to be what all the other big leagues are nfl nba nhl the game the game and it's not the game that's the problem with it there's a whole century of tradition with american soccer and rules that state in the U.S. Soccer Federation, that you have to, you know, take part in all the different competitions they do, which includes the Open Cup, and they're allowed to skate. I don't think that's right at all. Um, it's sad to me that only eight are in. I'm glad that the eight are there. Um, obviously, there'll be forces to contend with, but uh, it's it's tremendously, I think, wrong to have allowed them to basically skirt the rules, uh, and the rules state that if you're, you know. Part of professional soccer, you have to to play in all the competitions. That's you know, if you want to be sanctioned as the first division league, then then you have to be there. And there was basically, you know, U.S. soccer just let them do it, and that to me is wrong. I don't think it sends the right message. You know that it's going to be worse in the future. You know that MLS is going to try to get out of this altogether. They don't want to be a part of it. Uh, they want to be their own thing. And obviously, you know, League's Cup, the, the competition they've invented with League MX, uh, they talk about schedule congestion. Well, it's self-made. I mean, they've they've made their own bed in terms of their schedule uh, conflicts, and and they should be forced to lie on it, but they're not. Um, that's sad. That said, I think it's wonderful that the USL didn't, you know, pick its ball up and go home and, and gripe about it. Uh, the USL Championship. League One, League Two, those teams are going to be there, and they should be. And uh, I think that in many ways, MLS is kind of ceding their leadership role to the United Soccer League to take up that mantle for for the professional game and and kind of lead the way. Well, okay, USL is going to take it up and do exactly that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that there is a price to be paid and that MLS – listens to its fans, especially in cities like St. Louis, and comes back to the competition. But, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I, it's uh, it's clear that this, to me, it feels like it's a little bit about control and having control. Of, oh, yeah. Of, of, Absolutely. All of, of the money and, and... The power play. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely, uh, hopefully, this is a, a one-year situation. Um uh, I think also the timing of it, it's interesting because to me it's all about Messi in, this, in the sense that if Messi plays yeah. in, the, in the Open Cup, then that adds value to 
the tournament, which is not controlled by MLS, so that generates right. revenue for other teams that are not MLS. And I believe that's where the issue is coming from. Uh, hopefully, this gets addressed uh, in the near future because uh, I think that it's important to have a competition like the US Open Cup. Uh, I haven't said anything about the what happens with the winner of the US Open Cup if it, if it remains at spot for uh, the Champions Cup in Coca-Cola. That could be interesting if like a US yeah. team wins it, uh, that they get the chance to go there. Uh, yeah. But also I'm hearing that already Central America and the Caribbean already, and even the guy may start saying, well, it, MLS is not saying the best teams that should get that uh, additional spot. So we'll see how that yeah. plays out. Yeah, I'm sure that that's going to be a point of contention. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that said, if they're allowed to have it, you know, I hope they don't. I, I hope that I hope they didn't get to a situation where you know, should the USL championship or a USL team win the cup, that then they kind of yank the rug out from under them and say, no, we can't let you in. I think that would be a terrible precedent to set. Um, you know, that said, who, who knows what's going to happen? I'm sure that I wouldn't put it past them trying it. I just you know, it's really sad that we, we have to be here and, uh, and that MLS doesn't want to play. Um, I get that they want to be the big dog. I get that. Um, I get why they are where they are now, but, uh, you, you've got to play a part. That's what the rules state. They should be, they should be there, but yeah, I agree with you. It's absolutely a power play. It's a, it's a play for money. They want to control what they make, which they do with leagues cup, which they do obviously with, uh, you know, I know that CONCACAF Champions League is CONCACAF, but you should be a part of that. If you're, I don't think that they're going to withdraw from that competition. That's that's kind of a big deal because you get to play Liga MX and, and all the other big leagues around uh, uh, the Caribbean, Central America, and North America. So, yeah, that's the, you, be a part of that. But uh, you should be a part of U.S. Open Cup 2 MLS. Shame on you. Uh, just to go up, uh, yeah, I did on a better note, uh, I want to briefly about Ricardo Pepe in the last five minutes that we have here in this call. Uh, is there's the rumor that with US playing Copa America in the summer and then having the Olympics, that US can potentially try to have Pepe play in the Olympics and not Copa America. So just want to get your your thoughts on that. Ideally, I would hope for him to play in both. I know that's not realistic, but even though if I had to choose, I would probably still have him in Copa America rather than the Olympics. But I want to get your your two cents on that. I think both are. Um, just in terms of exposure, uh, equally as good. And I think the Olympics might actually be better for, in terms of his exposure, in terms of the PR, because it's the Olympics. It's not a soccer specific, you know, thing, even though, uh, that soccer specific thing is a bigger deal. Um, but I think for, for his own, you know, for his own PR, for the PR for American soccer, it's going to be a big opportunity for him. Uh, I would agree with you from a soccer standpoint, you'd rather him be with the senior team uh, and having his opportunities there. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, just in terms of a PR standpoint, I kind of understand it. Uh, and it's not going to be that much of a drop off, at least in terms of his exposure to the world uh, being in France, obviously, and being a part of a, an American team that you hope does well. I think that if they don't do well, well, then it's kind of a bust. But, but yeah, I think that uh, it'd be wonderful to have him with the senior team. That would be, that would be, I'm sure, what he's looking forward to. But I don't think the Olympics is going to be a big drop off in terms of his, in terms of his own personal exposure to the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I definitely would personally want to see him more in Copa America because I think that will benefit him more as part of yes. his continued growth uh, when it comes to the team and. He has this chip on his shoulder that he was left out of the World Cup roster that he wants to prove that he belongs there. But having yeah. said that, like I also get it, it would be fun to have him see in, in the Olympic side. And who knows? I mean, you, you, you potentially have the tandem of Diego Luna with Ricardo Pepe in the Olympics, and that would be fun as well. So I'm not entirely opposed to that either. Yeah, I mean either. I mean, it's it's not like it's it's not like it's not like a real demotion. It's it you, I mean, you you see. Obviously that uh, that he's not maybe being afforded the respect that that he ought to have, but uh, I also know that there's there are a lot of guys at the number nine position all of a sudden who are doing pretty well. Uh, so you know you talk about Josh Sargent with Norwich and 
and all the things he does. But, you know, Ricardo Pepe should have his opportunity. Um, yeah, I, uh, to me, it's not a huge drop off and, and an opportunity to win a to win a medal for an American team that, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, is going out. It's, it's wonderful that they're in the Olympics. It's going to be a lot of great exposure. Hopefully, Diego Luna is a part of that roster. I think that would be lovely to see. Uh, it, it's... It's not too bad a thing. It's not too bad a second prize for Ricardo Pepe. But it is second prize. I agree with you. All right. Uh, that's pretty much all the questions that I have. Uh, thank you so much again for, for coming on the podcast. Hopefully we can uh, reconnect sometime near the middle of the season to, to talk about how things are going with the, with the local border. Always love talking the beautiful game with you, Edwin. Thank you. I uh, think you. Do appreciate it. Thank you. Here in the Cocoa Podcast. Till next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>